Diversity. Culture. Humanity. Welcome to Mark Talk. What's up, guys, and welcome to episode two of Mark Talk. Thank you, because uh, episode one was really successful. And I want to give a shout out to you patrons, because you guys have helped to make this happen. I want to give a shout out to Joel, Sheila Hernandez, Khalil Mouassi, Zargs, Yaman Zain, Haven Gordon, and Nelson Davies. You guys rock. Today we have some uh, special guests. Some of them you may have seen already in the past videos, very successful videos. We've got with us Hamza from Kulun Arab and co-guest Mo Muhammad. How are you guys doing? Very well. Very well, man. Very well. How are you? Good, good. Thank you guys for coming. As you saw, I was saying, uh, buddy, it was uh, the last video did really well. Our uh, collaboration. Everybody's asking for part two. They want more people in there. Yeah. I'm just getting ready for it. We, we, you, by the way, you should be in that video too, Mo. We have to have this, sounds good. this sounds major good. Yeah, very... major Zoom call of like over 20 Arabs in one Zoom call. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be legendary. Three Arabs is enough. Imagine 20. <laughs> it's going to be logistically like not possible to arrange. <laughs> That's it, a, it's, it's just going to be chaos, but it's it's beautiful <laughs> chaos. It's just beautiful Arab But for some reason, we seem to like chaos a little bit. So. <laughs> That's how we roll, man. That's how we roll. Awesome. For, for those of you who don't know, just tell us a bit of what Quran Arab is, because when I discovered you, I thought it was amazing. And I just want to start by giving you a shout out and props for what you've been doing. But just yeah. if you can share with the people exactly what is Quran Arab. I think for me, you know, when I look at the channel and like the, the message that we try and bring across, it's it's really just to, you know, give insight into, into you know, what a day in our life could be or could look like. And, and also just a paint a, a positive light uh, of, of our culture uh, and uh, and really just uh, the the interactions between us and uh, and highlight some of the 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 you know the the amazing things about our culture the things that we enjoy uh, yeah. and and also just to have fun with it a little bit that, that's essentially yeah no for sure I mean generally when we get together as because my circle of friends exists of, of mostly Arabs I would say and when we get together, we have such a blast every time. We laugh a lot. We have a lot of jokes, a lot of like inside jokes. So these are things that we kind of um, experience anyway. We have a lot of fun anyway. So we kind of take that energy and put that into video and kind of share it with the world. But the, I think the underlying message with Kuruna Arab was let's present Arabs in a day-to-day -day kind of normal way, which is kind of not really the norm nowadays. When you see Arabs in the news and the media, nine times out of ten, it's not so positive. So with Kuruna Arab, it's more to show the day-to-day -day kind of Arab, which whether you like or not, it humanizes us in a weird way. You bring it back the humanity into Arabs because we look like normal people. We're just having a good time. We're just day-to-day -day normal Arabs who get by and, and, and have a little laugh in the way. Exactly. Yeah. You, basically, you're normalizing Arabic culture because exactly. the problem yeah. is when you don't really understand what you're seeing. So, and when it's fed in the media, you keep seeing more negativity. So. You know, and I think it's important to also highlight that we've contributed to the world. We're not just a people who have existed in a vacuum and then popped out of nowhere. We now live in the UK and we're here to take somebody's job. But that's not the case. A lot of times when you look back into history, many people around the world have made contributions and Arabs are no exception. We've done the same thing. So it's worth to kind of point out, you know, when you talk about mathematics, we talk about all these different subjects. Look at what we've contributed to these areas. We have played a role in these areas. And I think it's important to highlight that because your average day-to-day -day person, especially the new generation, aren't aware so much of what we've done in the past. And so I think it's worth highlighting that and just showing it to the people. Absolutely, yeah. Well, speaking of, can you give us like two important Arab Arabic figures, Arabs in history who have contributed to the world? Muhammad and Hamza. <laughs> <laughs> Dropping some fire there. <laughs> you stare at him. Absolutely. That's it. <laughs> you stare at him, buddy. Right here. Right here. <laughs> this guy's ready for a boxing match. <laughs> yes, and who else? <laughs> besides besides your excellence? <laughs> Me, myself, and I Mark. <laughs> no, 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 I'm joking. It's um there's there's quite a few. I think uh not somebody who's Arab, but somebody who studied in, in Baghdad, in, in Iraq, at one point, is a, is a, a scholar named Al-Khawarizmi. 
I feel like his contributions to mathematics have been quite important. And um, he is somebody I think we should, even though he's not Iraqi or, of Iraqi origin, he's of Persian origin, I believe it is. Um, what he, where the, the places in which he studied and and the, which have allowed him to kind of uh, uh, produce the the, the 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 books of kind of um, knowledge that he's produced have been in our country. So that kind of shows that at one point in history there was there's attraction towards the Middle East or Baghdad or countries like that or cities like that that have been of great importance. But yes, I would say Al Khwarizmi is definitely one of them. Um, somebody else. Um... How about like the justice system that was also. Uh originated from the Middle East, right? <laughs> yeah, I think, I think actually Lebanon had the first the, the first book of uh, uh, law or something written down, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. But the, the first, I think, university. Uh, and university. if I'm not mistaken, the Khawarizmi provided the algebra. I've got one, actually. Um, the second person I would say is, uh, which is not a, a man, actually, it's a lady, it's a woman, uh, named Fatima al-Fahri. Who is um, who set up the first and still existing university in the history of the world um, in Morocco? What would be today Morocco, which I think is also a prominent figure, and it's and it's and it's so it's so uh, it's such a, a a point of of inspiration because it's something that was done in the past and it's still here today. It's still something you can take pride in today and say, look, this was built hundreds of years ago and we still have it to this day. And it was by a Muslim and it it was by a woman. So you have all these kind of stereotypes being smashed. You have a lady who's female, who's who's Arab, who's setting up all these, who's doing all these remarkable things that we can take pride in today. So I think Fatima al-Fahri and al-Khawarizmi are two um, two key uh, figures. Yeah, good point. And uh, it's very powerful when uh, something can have such legacy. You know, this is what several centuries, what almost a thousand years. It's very powerful. Yeah, um, yeah. But uh, I had a question concerning the your title uh, the title of your channel so for people who don't know what does kulun arab mean and why why did you choose that yeah so so kulun arab it, it basically means we're all arabs and i think what we're trying to say there that is that it, it, you know it doesn't matter which part from the middle east you're from like whether you're from iraq or, or syria or, or lebanon like we're, we're all arabs we we share similar culture and um, essentially, we're all you know we're all brothers and sisters. Essentially, that's right. So, in 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 the first sense, is the unifying idea behind it that I feel that a lot of times with Arabs you have um, quite a bit of um, attempts to separate us. You know, whether that's national or otherwise, there's quite a few attempts. I do feel that in the uh, Iraqis throughout history have had such a a, a drive to um, pan Arabism, if you like. So um, in that sense, it's similar that I want, I want us all to take pride in the fact that we are um, um, Arabic or Arab. Um, and in the second idea is more so to say that um, what we're presenting to you is mostly to do with Arabs. It's, it kind of suggests the niche in the name that what you're about to see, what, what you're about to kind of um, view is, is very Arabic. So just to kind of give that um, a heads up from before, from when you read the title. Um, why I chose Kulna Arab, um, to be honest, I've sat with Mo and I've sat with a number of different friends and we've talked about this for days. I said, look, I have an idea for a channel. Um, I can call it uh, All Arabic Things or I can call it this, that. So I've given them a number of names and I've sat down with a number of people. Um, and every time I said Kulna Arab, everyone seemed to think that it was kind of the best thing that, that was out there. So Muhammad thought it was certainly the best name. I've asked yeah, a few definitely. other friends. I mean, we're, we're both from Iraq, but you know, the point isn't just to, to focus on Iraqi culture or our niche, it's, you know, we want to explore all different parts of, of the yeah. Arab world. For sure, for sure. Uh, I mean, if if, if if I had the chance to, I would love to travel across all of North Africa and the Middle East and look into this stuff in, in a lot more depth, you know, because every country throughout North Africa and the Middle East, um, even though they speak Arabic, they're Arabic speaking, if you like, they offer such a unique perspective of how they understand Arabic culture or how they kind of... Um, uh, speak to uh, speak to others in a, in a specific way or a specific dialect. These are things I'd love to explore with um, with some of my friends, friend Muhammad or, or somebody. Yeah. I'd love to kind of go across those countries and and look into that further. It's super interesting. It's it's, it's su I, think about this, Mark. I'm gonna go from Iraq, which is like not far from that at all. It's like maybe two three hour flight at, at best, and the language is even though it's the same, it's completely different. The culture is completely different. Things look completely different. But we yet we are so similar. So that's so interesting. You go cr across all these countries, things are so different yet so similar. In the idea that if you know, if I was to greet you, we'd embrace, and it'd be so normal. If 
wants to hold your hand in public in Lebanon, it'd be so normal. Nobody would think, what are these guys holding hands for? It's so normal. So these things, um, they are different, but they are yet very similar. And these kind of uh, uh, little intricacies I'd love to explore further. And, you know, inshallah. And hopefully we can take our, our viewers on this journey with us. <laughs> yeah, that'd be amazing. Um, do you plan to? Because I think if you, if you, that, that's so much room for like vlogging, if you explored the whole Middle East, but from a Middle Eastern eye, right? From Middle Eastern yeah. angle. Not vlogging. I thought more of doing a, a, a documentary kind of series about that. So exploring all these Arabic countries and their differences and their similarities. Um, I, I spoke to Mohammed about this on a number of occasions, actually, where we thought about, you know, just, um, writing down a list of everything that a country has that is similar or different to the country next to it. To the country next to that to the country next to that and then and then traveling to these countries and then kind of exploring that firsthand and have it having that on camera maybe doing like a, a 15 20 part documentary or something but inshallah at some point it's something i want to look into you mentioned the pan-arabism but also the the divisiveness you've seen um do you mean from the media so do you find that the media in the west tries to divide arabic culture or do you find that happens within the arab world both, I think it's both external influence and internal influence is that one, we've allowed ourselves to be um, divisive. We've allowed ourselves to think, oh, he's different to, to the way I am, either in religion or in politics or in ideas or whatever it is, he is different to I am. When, and, you know, the, the, the thing I tried to actually prove with the DNA test that we did, which Mohammed was, was on that video, um, where he took a DNA test, the idea there was to prove we are all human beings and we come from everywhere. You want to claim you're 100% for one place, I promise you, if you go back far enough, you're not exactly that. So it's the idea that you should take pride completely in your nationalism to the point where you can say you're different to I am, I am better than you are. That's nonsense, because you may have some of him mixed in you. So, uh, you know, I think we've allowed ourselves to think that way. And also, I think there's been, of course, external influence for sure. Not, m not much that has been covered about the Middle East. Um, during my childhood, at least, has been positive. At no point have I seen something where I thought, oh, wow, I am so proud of being from Iraq. I thought, man, what, what good is there in being from Iraq? This, you know, the, since 2003, what much have you... Because after 2003, that's pretty much when I was in primary school and I was starting to kind of know where I'm from and my friends knew where I was from. And all I knew about my country was it's been completely destroyed. And there was an evil man named Saddam Hussein who they took down. And that's all, that's all you ever know. So not much pride has been instilled into us anyway. So yes, yeah, so it's both, uh, the media has impacted it for sure, but I think also we've allowed ourselves to, to a great extent to be affected by the media. We consume media so much that we allow it to, to impact how we think. And I think that's completely wrong. I think you should um, take it with a pinch of salt and come to your own conclusive understanding that if something evil is being said about, for example, the Druzis of, um, of Lebanon, or the Durzis, I'm not sure if I'm saying it correctly, the Durzis of Lebanon are being painted in a certain way or being perceived in a certain way, that we look into that, that if you know someone who knows a friend that may be of, of, of the Dursi religion, they speak to him and say, what's your religion all about? And, and clarify it with them, rather than demonizing them. If you know somebody who's Christian, for instance, and you don't have any Christians in your area, that's worth speaking to that person and getting to know them and, and clarifying it firsthand, not allowing yourself to be consumed by external opinions or ideas. What do you think? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I would say definitely that, you know, I mean, growing up in my, in my childhood, you know, and, and, and I grew up in, in Holland and it was, you know, it was a small town in Holland growing up there. And it was clear that a lot of people around me, or the, or the people that I went to school with, you know, they, they weren't very familiar with my culture. They weren't very familiar with my traditions and, and they saw me from, they, they saw me as different. And all they knew was what the media was portraying, which was, um, which was very negative. It was, you know, we were pretty much always being painted as as terrorists um and and, and that was the, the the message that um was portrayed and and essentially you know and and then you know you grow you, you're growing up and, and you see that being reflected in in, in people's uh behavior uh, and, and and the way that they interact with you as well and it, it grows into a stereotype and a lot of it is also it turns and turns into something which, which is also like a subconscious uh, stereotyping as well so hopefully that's yeah. a that's a bias and i think it's it's becoming better now because the, you know the subject is is now being talked about a lot more there's a lot more connectivity around the world you know the the internet is a lot more in, we're in a world that is so integrated uh, which 15 years ago wasn't the case so i think we're, we're 
taken a step in the, in the positive direction, but clearly there's still a lot of work to do. Yeah, for sure. You know, I think, Mark, in a way, because I'm from Holland as well, and one thing Mo and I have in common, apart from just being Iraqis and handsome, is that we're both also from Holland. So, so, uh, so here we uh, go, man. Iraqi fly kicking in. <laughs> <laughs> and it's funny, you guys don't look alike, which is another cool thing. I, I think it's, it's part of the stereotype is that the, the, the perception that all Arabs look dark brown in a certain way and they with the mean a aggressive look but like i've seen <laughs> i've seen in lebanon some redheads you know so again, <laughs> middle eastern identity is, is more diverse than the west seems to uh, have understood but yeah sorry you were saying you're from yeah, holland one of my friends he's ginger he's generally ginger <laughs> there you go ginger. and he's, he's, iraqi. he's iraqi i have dark skinned um iraqi friends curly head straight head exactly yeah so this is another important thing for pe for people to see. Uh, yeah, you were saying you're from Holland. Yeah, I mean we're from, from different, different cities in Holland. So Hamad is uh, um, more from a village, I would say. Is it yeah. Holland? So so essentially we we moved, moved from from, uh, from, from Iraq into Holland as as refugees, and we got placed in this um, in this village, which was somewhere in the north of Holland. Like it's. It's quite rural. There's a lot of like farmers and stuff around. So yeah. it wasn't, you know, it wasn't a very populated city. It was, you know, pretty rural, small, small village. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's pretty much where I spent half my, half my, half my childhood up until, up until the, I'd say, say the age, age of 10. 10. And then we and moved, then moved around, around Holland a bit before, before we came to the UK. You yeah. both grew up in Holland initially and you came as refugees. What, what year was this? 97. 97, we yeah. moved to, to Holland. Right. Okay. So you you were about five six years old when uh, two thousand three. And when did you move to the UK? Well, what got you from Holland to the UK? So uh, yeah, so we 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 moved to Holland initially. So we left Iraq in ninety four. So I was I turned one on the way to Jordan when my um when my father um for obvious reasons sought to escape the country for for a better future for his children um to Jordan. I was out turned one on the way. So when we got to Jordan, they, um, after several months, I believe, they gave us uh, um, asylum in, in, in Holland. So we remained in Holland for, I think, about a year. And then we moved to uh, a place called um, Ramsgate in the UK after about a year and a half. We lived in the UK for about another two, two three years and then moved back to Holland again to, to another city, So which was a slightly bigger city. So it wasn't as like... Uh, um, rural, if you like, as, as the initial city that we were placed in. Um, so, yeah, we moved to a city called um, Harlem. So, like the Harlem you have in, 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 in New York, this is also called Harlem. Well, apparently this is the original Harlem, like the, the Harlem in New York was named after this city in Holland. Um, so, yeah, we, we, I lived there until about the age of 12, so 2005. And then in 2005, we moved to, to the UK to seek better job opportunities because Holland wasn't exactly the place my dad kind of saw himself raising his children and having the kind of job prospects for them when they grow up. So we moved to London for that reason. Um, when 2003 happened, so the, the attack on Iraq, I was about 10 years old. So you're old enough to kind of understand what's happening with all these uh, problems in the Middle East and back home. You're old enough to kind of see that your parents are crying on the phone because one of the relatives has passed away. So you're kind of old enough to absorb all of that, but you're not really old enough to understand why it's happening. So you're at that age. Even in fact, I remember we had a newspaper man come to my house. So a journalist came to my house to interview us because we're the only Iraqi family in the whole neighborhood. So he came to us uh, to interview us about uh, to, uh, the, the, the fall of Saddam, if you like. And um, I remember he was asking me as a 10 year old, he's asking, what do you think of that? Are you happy that he's gone? That evil man, what do you think of him? We did this for you and then, and then. So I'm, I'm the whole time sitting there thinking like it's, uh, I'm not entirely sure what I should think about anything, you know, apart, all I know is the destruction that has been done to my family. That's all I'm aware of as far as the wider things that happen to have this old, you know, Dutch man sitting asking me questions like that, I thought it was, was silly now that I look back. But yeah, so we, I, I think we moved to, to London at a quite, quite a similar time frame. So for me, it was in 2005 when I was 12. Yeah, I moved. I moved to, to to the UK in two thousand and nine, and it's for for similar reasons as well. Um, it, you know, my, my parents were struggling to to really get things going in Holland. There was a lot of bureaucracy, and and you know, London living here, it's a lot more multicultural. It's much easier to to start your own thing. It's it's 
you know, the, the community here is much bigger as well. It's so much easier to, to find support. There's a lot more mosques around here. Um, whereas in, in, in Holland, it's, it's less multicultural. It's, it's, it's less, there's less mosques around, there's less um, opportunities around there. Um, whereas in the, in the UK, in London specifically, um, it's a lot better. So. Mark, I, I don't think, have you been to London before, Mark? I haven't, but it's on my list. My brother has. Cousins have lived there. Never got the chance to go. Wow. It's on my list, man. I think in terms of diversity, I promise you, it is unlike anything you've ever seen across the world. I think very few cities in the world are as diverse as London is. You have people from all over the planet and all types of weird mixes that you've never seen before that you'll see in Holland. Um, sorry, in London. I think for me, you know, growing up, I think it's, it's you know, they look at you as, as one of two um, they either think you're a troublemaker, you know, you know you're there, you're, you're a criminal or a terrorist, um, you know, you're a bad person in general, or they think you're just there to um, take money from the state. You know, you receive benefits and whatever, yeah, yeah. and you're you're there. You know, you're not there to actually contribute to society. You're there just to stay home, get paid your benefits, and 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 use the taxpayers' money essentially. So it's. It's it's one of those two that you're generally perceived in. Um, you know, my, my experience growing up. I mean, I went to to primary school where I was the only colored person in the entire school. There was no one else that was. Uh, you were the was race. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And um, you know, and I mean, I was I was still too young to like actually realize what was going on around me. But you know, looking back now, I you know I, I can see clearly of of the you know the dynamics that that was going on, and and I remember this, and I remember I have like flashbacks of, of moments that you know made it really clear to me of of the, the the social dynamics and how different it was. It's you know back then, especially in primary school, people used to go to each other's houses a lot, right? Like if you, you know you have friends, you know after school, you, you know you go to someone else's house to, to play at their house. And it was very rare, you know, especially in the beginning, it was very rare for anyone to, to come to my house. And it's not that, you know, it's not that the kids didn't want to play with me. I, I had friends at school and, and I played with them during, you know, lunchtime and break time and, and we were fine. You know, they, you know, they were too young to recognize as well, but I think it was the parents that were too afraid or scared to have their children over at my house. And, and I remember this very clearly. I remember sitting in class and the teachers actually made a point of it, of, you know, someone, you know, why does no one go to Muhammad's house to, to play with him? You know, and, and I was obviously, you know, and I remember, you know, the teacher speaking to, to my parents and, mm. and, you know, I didn't know what was going on at the time. I, you know, I had no idea that it was a race thing, right? Um, but, but yeah, those, those dynamics did, did exist. So education seems to be the uh, the key, or sorry, the lack of education seems to be the, the, the key problem and education the cure. Because everything you've been saying yeah. about Holland, for example, was just this fear because of lack of understanding with, you know, instead of London, which was yeah. like your friend could be your teacher for a second to tell you, no, this is not how we are. And just you being exposed to it would open your eyes. Mm -hmm. But yeah, you, you being the uh, the only colored person in your entire school and it's it's funny because you're saying kids didn't seem to have a problem with it as much as the parents so you can see where the you know misinformation starts it and sure the is. education you know you're being conditioned to live a certain way and you grow up and it becomes more ingrained so i've always believed that education was the key to yeah. to solve many problems and not so much educational but in a compassionate way so in my past working in different jobs if I would encounter racism that sometimes comes in very subtle, very ignorant, as opposed to hateful directly. Um, and just having a different experience for them, seeing that you're this normal human being, treating them with kindness, they're like, oh, <laughs> suddenly they walk out of there and they're happy. So, and I, I believe that anytime you're faced with, even, even if it's hate, even if it's just, you know, fear, because often it's fear, the anger you see, the hate towards the Arabs, it's usually from yeah. fear and ignorance. So the weight against that, I think, is not by going fist up shouting, but educating kindly. Which we do a lot. <laughs> but that goes back to the point I was making earlier, uh, Mark, as to why I started calling Arab. It's, it's literally for that reason.
to just look like we're normal human beings, we're day-to-day -day people just trying to get by and have a little laugh. That's all it is, you know? Because a lot of times, nine times out of 10, it's you have an extreme image of what a person's like, then you meet them and you're like, oh, you're not too bad, actually. So that's literally what the channel's for, is to give them, oh, you're not too bad, kind of the, that image. And it's not so much for people that come from London. I think, honestly, I'm, I'm, I'm convinced people in London have no... People in London are aware of what Arabs are like. People in New York kind of understand what Arabs are like. People that have Arabs in their city are aware of what Arabs are like. They're not as, as crazy as we're portrayed. But it's more for people that come from cities like Muhammad or cities like where I grew up um, when, we, when we were younger, where there is no Arab. It's like one odd Arab or two odd Arabs who are perceived as like evil and uh, uh, job taking and, and they're looking to hurt other people type of Arabs. It's for the, if people need, uh, live in these communities, who can then kind of look at these videos and go, oh, they seem pretty normal, or they seem pretty okay, or they seem cool. Um, it's more for them, for, for them to, you know, for, for, for people that watch it in our cities, they're not going to think, oh, they're actually quite cool. They're going to think, oh, we're so amazing, look at us. That's more the kind of thought they'd have, rather than, they're not too bad. Because we know we're not too bad. We're not, you know, Mark, you and I both know that we're normal and that we're just like everybody else. We love our families, we want to protect them and look after them. And that's all it is. But it's, it's, it's you know, so it's, it's more for them that they, they, you know, two target audiences, one thinks that we're okay and that we're not too bad. And then one thinks, yes, we, you know, this is who we are. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, the normalizing in a very, very uh, simple way. Um, speaking of, have you seen, since you started Kulun Arab, have you seen, uh, have you had a personal experience of maybe somebody walking up to you or just seeing a change in perception of Arab while walking on the street? In a way, have you seen the fruit of your labor? Um, not directly. I see more in the in the in the emails that I receive, or the DMs, or or, or comments. Not so much in in person. Mm -hmm. I mean, I have had people come up to me and say, "I've seen you before. I know who you are." Or in in weird in very weird spaces, like in spaces that I least expect for somebody to recognize me, I get recognized, <laughs> and I'm like, "Oh, not here! Please go away." <laughs> <laughs> so, um, yeah. I mean, I've, I, you know, you just get told, "Oh, man, I like your videos. They're funny." Like. Um, but I think the really heartfelt kind of messages come more online. They don't come so much in person. In person is more like, oh, I've seen your videos. I like what you do. Um, work with this person, work with that person. Or they just give you ideas of things to do. But in, in I think the, the more heartfelt stuff is definitely online. I've had people write me all types of um, really like, um, like cute messages, man. Like things like, um, um, you know, I, I've never felt pride in being Iraqi. But watching your you know videos about Iraqi words, that really made me feel like, we mean something or, you know, messages like that, they, they really warm your heart a little bit and make you feel better. Or messages about Muhammad, about my friends. You know, when people say nice things about my friends, I'm completely uh, um, head over heels for them. Like, I don't, honestly, when people write me nice messages about Muhammad or about uh, Hassan or my other friends, that's nice to see also. But as far as Arab perception, that's more online than in person. Online, okay. So comments like... Um, what kind of comments, for example? Well, without going too much into detail, but what kind of comments, for example, have you seen that you thought, ah, I'm glad I started that channel? Mm. Uh, wow, like I would say they're the most, the most inspirational ones, and like, uh, and I'm like, wow, that's amazing. Would be, um, oh, I had one teacher say, I, I, I really loved this video so much. I showed it to my students in class. Um, the DNA video that was. Um, I've had video. Oh, I, actually, I've had another one say, um, I think they were like a, a lecturer at university. I can't remember what they were. And this was initially like maybe a good seven, eight months ago. And they said they used the Arabs and Latinos videos with one of their students to with their students to try and find out who's which one's which. So I've had that email as well. I've had emails from um, um, I mean, there's, there's a lot of them, Mark. If it, the fact that there's so many is exactly is already a, you know, a great sign. <laughs> Yeah, man, I'm I'm thankful. Like I'm honestly that and people to take their round take the time out to write these messages. I love that. I, I appreciate it so much. It's it's it's, it, it's definitely inspirational. I, I don't think I realize because people think um because sometimes I get a lot of them. I just kind of like leave it to the side and I finish what I have to do and then get back to them later. So it seems like a late response. But generally, I when I get a nice message, I try to get back to them as much as I can because it's it's it does push me a little bit more to do some extra videos and, and extra work. Of course, yeah, and you, you see how the fans get close, they become close, and they really, uh, they appreciate what you do. Yeah, and then you have, like, the, the non-Arabs who are learning Arabic, that's even more phenomenal. Like, you have, you know, last week, one Dutch person, actually, this is interesting, a Dutch guy sent me 
a link. He's saying, oh, nice, you know, nice video. The dialect video, this is actually, that we did together. He sent me a link of him speaking Arabic. And I was just so fascinated as to how uh, a non-Arabic person learned Arabic so well that he can speak it in Fusha without any mistakes in his harakat. That's phenomenal. Um, but yeah, one of my target audiences is definitely also people that are learning Arabic. Because a part of learning Arabic is also um, learning Arabic culture. And that's what, you know, from time to time you have like little Arabic words pop out. And I think people find them interesting. And then you have like little gestures that we do, which I think people find interesting. So that's definitely also a target audience. That's exactly it, man. When when you get people who are not from the Middle East show so much interest and fascination, you're like, whoa, that's amazing. Yeah. yeah. You're really showing them a side that they've never seen before. They're like, wow, okay, I never see this in the news. Thank you, you know. <laughs> yeah. I mean, on social media, that's one positive thing from social media I've appreciated. This freedom to, yeah. to, to, to share something you wouldn't before because of corporate media. Yeah. I said to Mohammed before I started the channel, uh, right after I gave him the, the list of names, I said, my target audience, if you remember, are three. One, it's the it's the Arabs living here in the West. Two is the Arabs living back home to see what we live like in the West. And three is for non-Arabs who are learning Arabic or trying to understand Arabic culture. That's it, just those three. So so it's interesting. We've pretty much touched on all three. Yeah, that's exactly my demographics. I get uh, people who are, you know, they're from the diaspora. So they're connecting with their roots and they're like, oh my God, it reminds me of my grandma and my grandpa. And yeah. I get to connect with my roots. Uh, you got people who are in there seeing what's happening on the outside and they feel proud. They feel represented. And like you said, people who are non-Arab, so fascinated by it. And they're like, a lot of what Arabs are, they're just like us Latinos. Or, oh, yes. uh, we, we yeah. Africa do the same thing. Or, oh, we Asians do yeah. the same thing. So yeah. what's the lesson behind all that is that Two things for me is there's so much diversity and differences, which I think is beautiful because everybody's unique. But under all of that, we're actually all very similar. We're very yeah, yeah. similar. We're just humans. We're just human beings. Yeah. And we have a lot of things in common. So it's great to see. What does that say about identity? Is it ethnic or is it more cultural? Let's say, you know, you're born in Iraq. So clearly yeah. you're Iraqi and your parents are too. So by that yeah. regard, you're ethnically Iraqi. But if you discover mm -hmm. that you're 30 percent, um, I don't know, from Ghana, maybe. What does mm -hmm. that say about your identity? Does that mean you are actually, you know, ethnically from Ghana, or as an identity, are you still Iraqi in your eyes? And if so, yeah. that, that means that your identity is more cultural than than actually by blood. So if yeah. I push it to an extreme, if you're born and raised in Japan or China, would you be Chinese looking the way you are? Or would you still be Iraqi? I've, I've, we've discussed this on so many occasions. <laughs> like I've, I've said to Muhammad at one point, um, what makes an Iraqi an Iraqi? Is it the fact that he's born in Iraq because any Tom, Dick and Harry can be born in Iraq? Is it the fact he speaks Arabic because anybody can speak Arabic? You can get somebody from here in London, fly out to Iraq and learn the Iraqi dialect better than Iraqis themselves. So what makes him Iraqi? Is it the fact that they have black hair and a black beard? You know, you can get a, a, a Syrian or you can get somebody from, from Latin America who looks the exact same as an Iraqi. So it's definitely not in the looks in that case. So, you know, you, you ask yourself those questions and you really start to think, you know, what makes anyone anything? You know, is race actually a thing? Um, so I think the closest thing that you can really point to and say that's the thing that you identify with as a country would be culture. It's literally culture. I, I, it's not. It, it, of course, even that isn't a defining factor, but it's the closest thing to which you can kind of look at and say that's probably what makes you from that particular uh, part of the world. It's the culture because anything else pretty much can be learned, and and even culture to an extent can be learned, but it would be the closest factor to it. Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, it, it doesn't make any sense to say that. Oh my, like, you know, my blood is Iraqi. Like that. That statement is, doesn't make any sense because, like, you know, like you said, you're. You know your heritage comes from you know many different places and i think it's very much so the the environment that you grew up in the the, the culture so i mean to answer your question like if you know e even if i grew up born and raised and grew up in japan I, you know culturally at home you know we, we'd still have iraqi culture i'd still identify myself as as iraqi essentially so i think it's it's very much culture it's not it's not about the, the way that you look or the way that you speak or, or, or any of those factors. Yeah.
Because, it's, Mark, you know, if you went to Iraq, they could mistake you for an Iraqi, you know. And if you learned our dialect, you could easily pass for an Iraqi. So it's definitely not in the the looks or how you speak. I think it's, 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 it's such a, even I've heard people say, and this is what even, you know, excuse my French, it might have fucked me even more. It's, 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 they said even culture you can put to one side and then add to that religion. That's, that religion would be the key identi identifying factor for your identity. It wouldn't be even culture. They went even deeper than that. So it's, you know, there's so many, you know, what makes you, you, you know, is it where you grew up? Is it where you're from? It's such a, it's such a, these, these are the type of questions, Mark, you'd have to go to like a, a Bahar in, in Beirut and like just sit by the, sit by the Bahar and just think for hours on end and figure out who you are and, you know, be a bit poetic or romantic with the show. But yeah, these are such deep questions, but I think, you know, the closest I've gotten to understanding that would be culture because, you know, culturally I do feel. Uh, a part of that is also English or Western, if you like. Yeah, hundred percent. Can be a mix. Can be a mix. I'm mixed race. I'm not Sinhalese. I'm not Sahrawi. Yes, I'm mixed. Culturally, us being having grown up also in the West, there's a new element that gets introduced. So your identity kind of morphs and becomes a bit of a hybrid. You kind of pick up on your roots. Well, you have your roots, and you pick up on the various places that you live in, you grew up in. So in my case, living up here, I, I, and you know, I'm very rooted in my, in my Lebanese culture, but I'm also very much, um, immersed in the West. So I think that's another important factor, like you were saying. So your home is an environment, a bit of a society and the outside is as well. So like you were saying about Japan, if it is the case, you might feel like you're partly Japanese and partly Iraqi at home. So I yeah, think yeah. it's really cool. Um, the mix we get from there. Um, where are you? I see Hamza's phone now. You guys disappeared. Yeah. yeah one second. Sorry, Mark. Um, can you see me now? Yeah, you're back. Yeah. But Speaking of, um, how many languages do you speak? Cause last time you, you spoke Spanish, like a native <laughs> down in Cuba, Puerto Rican. <laughs> ah. <laughs> that I, um, I, well, Spanish is weird. My my Spanish is because I went to Col I went to live in Colombia at one point for for about three months. Mohammed came to visit me, by the way, for two weeks. He loved it. He absolutely had a, a blast. He'll tell you more about that in a second. Yeah. But so initially, when I picked up Spanish, it was it's Colombian Spanish. So it was very like I pasero, dímelo. It sounded very Colombian Spanish. Then when I moved back to London, all my friends are Dominican and I listen to a lot of Puerto Rican music. So you have like the, 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 the reggaeton slash um, bachata slash salsa kind of from Puerto Rico that I listen to. So it ended up being a, a very much a mix between the two. So now I have a very Dominican slash Puerto Rican accent, which is weird because I, I, I don't pronounce my S's anymore and it's, it's weird, it's weird. That's what it sounded like. Yeah, yeah. So you lived in <laughs> Colombia for three months. Why? Yeah. yeah. And how was that? It, it, oof, it, that experience, I would say, was uh, probably the best three months of my life. That's how amazing it was. One, it's the first time I ever moved out and lived on my own. Uh, two, I went to a place where I had no kind of uh, friends, no friends, no family. I knew nobody. I had no connections out there. Uh, Three, I didn't know what I was going to do that apart from I want to learn Spanish and whether that be in a institution or my own, I want to learn the language. So it's, it's you know, there were so many factors that went into that that made it such a phenomenal experience. And four, I went to a place where I thought, Mark, look, I've spoken to hundreds of people. They've all said to me, oh, Colombia, you know, you've got the drugs and the and the, and the the narcotics and the, and the gangs. and the So I, you go, all these factors that kind of play into it made it so much of a, a better experience. Because you, I went up there and I expected it to be this bad and it turned out to be this good. So it's it was a phenomenal experience. The people there, the day to day people are such amazing people. They're very kind, very similar kind of customs to Arabs in the in the way that they deal with you. They treat you like almost that like you're like your family after having met them for for a day. So very warm hearted then. And you learned? Did did you manage to learn the language in three months? Were you able to speak very comfortably? Well. I remember I went to visit him. I was there for the for two weeks. So I went to visit him and uh, you know, 
we, we used to go to like the restaurant and like, you know, he, he pretty much communicated as if he lived there for 10 years. <laughs> you must have yeah, shocked a lot of them, man. Yeah. Before you just blended in and nobody knew. Nobody knew that you were Iraqi. You were like, oh. Yeah, I'd wear an era hat and like a tracksuit bottom and tracksuit top and then go out and then just, you know, they wouldn't, they wouldn't recognize I was from, from, from any other country but Colombia. But then as soon as you speak, because, you know, in three months, I still think it's not enough time to pick up the exact uh, dialect. I have a very good ear for, for, for dialects. That's both English, um, Arabic. Uh, I, have, I have a very good ear for, for sounds, I would say. So when I go to a country like Colombia and I hear them speak in a certain way, I pick up those sounds very easily. And I'm able to kind of imitate those sounds in the same way that I didn't grow up in England. I'm not from here. I only came here when I was 12 years old. So when I when I when I got to the country initially, I didn't sound like this. I sounded very American in the way I spoke slash Dutch. I had a very weird Dutch slash American accent. Uh, but within a year or two, I had already picked up the sounds of what London English sounded like, and I was able to kind of speak in that way. And speaks the Queen's English now. <laughs> speak the, yeah, I speak the Queen's English. Quite <laughs> posh. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I mean, that's why picking up the dialect was no issue there because once I kind of got used to the sound, how they pronounce things and why they said certain things in a certain way, I was able to kind of make sense of that in my head and then imitate that in, in my own way of speaking. So I was able to do Colombian accent after a while. I can't do it now because I haven't been in so long and I, and, I, and I never speak Colombian Spanish anymore. So now it's more the kind of Caribbean Spanish. But yeah, I have, I've got the sound for it. After three months, I was good enough to kind of sound almost like I'm from there. Not quiet because my vocabulary wasn't wide enough, but it was close. It was close. Very cool. So that's English, Arabic, Spanish. I believe there's a fourth language you speak. Dutch. Dutch. Five. I speak five. Five. Uh, so what's the fifth? The language of love. Oh, <laughs> <my> baby. <laughs> yeah, we Arabs are very good with that language. Um, do you have anything you want to add? I think we have to wrap up soon, but if there's something you want to add, please feel free if you want to say something to the fans. There's a chance. Where can um, we find you guys, by the way, for, for people who uh, have just met you? Yeah, Kulun Na'arab is generally where you can find us on both uh, YouTube and Instagram and Facebook. It's Kulun underscore Arab. Um, more specifically for Muhammad's on my personal Instagram, um, that would be, uh, for mine, would be Hamuza93. It's a nickname I grew up with. See the romance yeah. right there? I'm, uh, <laughs> I'm <losing>. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it was a nickname given to me by by almost every uncle I've ever met when I was younger and auntie. So um, Ham was a 93 and then Hamid. I think, yeah, uh, I think the best way to get in touch is, is yeah, follow us through through Instagram and, and feel free to, to send us, leave us a message of what kind of content you'd like to see. Uh, and uh, we're, we're more than happy to, to try to do your best. And make sure you, you um, follow, if, if you haven't done so already, make sure you follow and, and subscribe to Mark's channel. It's phenomenal. I've seen it. I've watched the videos. Very diverse, like with almost, like mixing Arabic culture with all types of other cultures as well. Interesting videos to see. Thank you, man. No, it's not about me today. It's about you guys. <laughs> know yourselves. <laughs> well, I appreciate it, man. And same for you. Ever since I discovered your channel, I have to say it's uh, I've been very proud and happy to see what you're Thank doing. You, and you got to keep doing that. Your channel is only going up and Thanks. people need to see these things. And I have personally in person online, I'm seeing the Arab, um, the perception of Arab change in a positive way. So I'm very optimistic about that. But Same. we have to keep doing that. It's the only thing that is working for us it's the only thing that is successful at you know achieving this goal so more power to you and let's keep doing what we are inshallah awesome. i agree i mean i reached twenty thousand subscribers yesterday it was it? yeah twenty thousand yesterday and i've been over the moon since and i'll be very honest it's it's part part of that has been um my my uh willingness to work with other people i i tend to well i always have this like little insecurity where i think oh, i'm not big enough to work with all these big youtubers you were nice enough to say I'd, lo I'd love to work with you because um, we spoke over Instagram and you were happy to get involved. Um, and since then, it's been nothing but, you know, the, the expansion has been amazing. You know, from through you, you've, you've introduced me to some amazing people as well. And for that, I'm grateful. And I'm happy, actually, um, uh, you gave me that opportunity to put me on because uh, I, I thought I wouldn't really realistically be able to work with anyone until I get to about 100,000 subscribers. For you to have worked with me when I was about, you know, 17 or 16, was phenomenal and that was kind of you so I'm, I'm grateful for that too i have to i have to 
it's okay. nothing man it's uh i used to wonder about that before because you want to in your mind you want to appear like you're on a credible professional uh scale but you realize that a sk you know being huge is not necessarily what translates to quality so and in your yeah. case you're peaking like you're on your way to becoming very big and where you deserve to be so you can reach even more people thank you man and you're only going from there, so keep it up, man. Oh, sure. Any any videos planned? Any videos planned for uh, for the fans? Um, I have one exciting. Well, I'm definitely doing a part two for uh, Arabs Get a DNA Test um, uh, soon. That's planned in the next, I would say, month or so. Arabs and Latinos are also planned around the same time. Uh, but I've got one called Types of Iraqis coming out very soon. The different types of Iraqis that you have, Mr. Shad and Mr. Mr. Pick Up Lions and Mr. Uh, sweep you off your feet and then uh, mr doctor and all types of different iraqi characters that you'll see in the in the iraqi community this is more specifically for the iraqi uh, uh the iraqi people but everyone's gonna enjoy it i think every arab's gonna see themselves in one of these characters awesome i look forward to that man cool i think we're gonna do a q a video at some point as yeah well. we're actually doing a q a soon as well yeah. yeah so if people have questions feel free to to dm me and i'll, and I'll definitely pick you up absolutely awesome. awesome guys well thank you thank you for coming thank you for being on the show thank you and for having us mark it's a All pleasure the best. 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 Well, thanks for having us let's meet sometime oh, absolutely yeah yeah well, online <laughs> <laughs> no come down to london <laughs> yeah of course man it's on my list so there you go hamza and muhammad from the awesome kulun arab channel thank you guys for watching and listening to another mark talk episode two don't forget to subscribe, to like, and to share so more people can appreciate Middle Eastern culture. And don't forget to subscribe to Kulun Arab for more Arabic content. And for you guys who want to see the extended version, head over to Patreon and you can support at the same time, which is always great for this channel. And you can download the full audio. Thanks again for watching and listening. This is your host, Mark Hashem. And as usual, take care. This is a rising picture. Duh.